that's you might want to take a second look at it. Well, and I, I have looked at. Yeah, it at looks to me like these everything that's in P two looks like it is. There's a cover page. We're, we're happy to exclude that, Your Honor. Okay, that's that's, that was my question. What about the cover page? We'll, we'll exclude that from. All right. So you basically are going to pick up from page twenty two one twenty eight to one twenty eight. So twenty two. That's right, Your Honor. Thank Which you. is just the text and the tweets and the enclosures. Exactly, Your Honor. I'm going to admit it unless one well, you, you've reserved, uh, yes, and I know you reserved ruling on this, whether or not it was authenticated, and of course we have made our individual objections right. uh, yesterday. Right. And uh, if that and satisfies they're preserved. you. And they're preserved. Yeah. If you want, you're preserving those. In other words, yes, please. All right, uh, we're going to preserve the objection, I'm going to admit. Okay. Um, before we rest, Your Honor, we have one piece of last piece of evidence, which is plaintiff's. Uh, I'm sorry, P73, which is a video. It's 14 minutes long, Your Honor. Which one is this? This is the Washington Post um, video. Have I already admitted it? It shows the events of January 6th. Did, did I not already admit this? Yes, I think, I think okay, it was why admitted. Why does the audience need to watch that? I can watch. That's that's fine. We we thought that I've already watched it a couple of times. Okay. Uh, again, I mean, one of these things about uh, the, the it's only 17 minutes. There's uh, a lot of material in the record, which obviously was not the subject of today's hearing, which I'm perfectly happy to refer to, refer to and review in connection with the briefs. So, uh, but I don't know that we need to play the video. It's Washington Post video. It's available on public sources, right? As you wish, Your Honor. All right, great. Okay. Any anything else, Mr. Shell? Uh, no, no. The, Before we do close, the petitioners. I rest. You rest. Anything else, Mr. Proctor? We rest. Very well. All right. Well, then I'll hear closing. Um, petitioners get the last word. Mr. Bach, you get to you get to go first. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I again want to talk about the law, and then I'll talk about the evidence that has been submitted and whether or not that evidence meets the correct legal standards that we believe are applicable here. Uh, of course, we enter procedure under North Carolina State Law 22-1-5, which permits Secretary of State to remove someone as a candidate for office if, one, they do not qualify as a candidate for office, uh, or number two, if they are not eligible to take office, and in this case on January 3rd, 2023. Now, they assert a disqualification under Section 3 uh, is that uh, Representative Green engaged in insurrection or rebellion after taking the oath of office on January 3rd, and, uh, uh, and I assume uh, even though they're not clear, on January 6th. Um, Section 3 also provides that, con that, quote, Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. In other words, remove the political disability of not being able to take office by taking the oath, which is the trigger. And, um, uh, and they can do that at any time. You can see the wording of the last sentence is not time limited. In other words, it could, could have been done last week. It could be do, done next, next month. It could be done on January 3rd, 2023, when Representative Green presents herself. And before she's sworn in, Congress could pass a, stat a, stat a statute under Section 3, the last sentence, and she would then be qualified to take office. How in the world do we know right now that she will not be qualified on January 3rd, 2023? when Congress at any time, either for her in particular or for a class of people as Cong Congress has done. In fact, there were 
thousands of individual amnesties granted and then to general amnesties granted by, by the Congress. <coughs> they could do that at any time. It is impossible for this court to know at this time that she is not eligible to take office because of that contingency that could be exercised by Congress at any time in the future, up until January 3rd. That means this is nothing. She cannot be viewed as disqualified today because it's in, it cannot be determined that she is ineligible for office on January 3rd, 2023. That should end this. Now, second, uh, this has already happened. The amnesty has already been granted. The simple argument about this is the 1872 Amnesty Act uh, relieved uh, the disability under Section 3 to, quote, all persons whomsoever. Representative Green is a all persons whomsoever. And it relieved the political disability that Section 3 imposed. And by the way, the word imposed here is a past participle, meaning that phrase imposed by Section 3 is an adjective on regarding what political disabilities are we talking about. Because absent that modifier of that of political disability, uh, it could be you are a felon, you lost your civil rights, and we're giving you uh, amnesty from uh, the political disability that you cannot uh, take office as a convicted felon. So the only way to know what political uh, disabilities we're talking to is the past participle. I didn't know this at the beginning, Your Honor. The past participle imposed by, the, by Section 3. Now we also know that Section 3 is both retrospective because it affected anyone in the past that had engaged in insurrection or rebellion after taking the oath and disqualified them from office. But it also had a prospective effect because why would we be here? If it didn't have a prospective effect, what would be, what would be the basis to apply this to Representative Green? So we know it has both perspective and retrospective. And in the Amnesty Act of 1872, it was removed. That, that retrospective or prospective political disability under Section 3 was removed for all persons whosoever. And the, court in, the district court in North Carolina agreed with that analysis. That case is now an appeal. The, uh, the district court here in Atlanta did not, and that case is on appeal. So you get to be the tiebreaker, all right? Now, uh, we also know that when they used, when the, uh, the 1872 Amnesty Act was adopted, that they did intend to, be, to it to be both retrospective and prospective because of the wording of the 1898 Amnesty Act. The 1898 Amnesty Act, after the phrase disabilities imposed by the third section of the 14th uh, Amendment of, uh, Article of Amendments to the Constitution of the United States, inserted the words heretofore incurred. That is not in the 70th version. So Congress knew very well how to do a retrospective amnesty if they chose to do it. Because in 1889, that's exactly what they did. A retrospective only amnesty based on the words heretofore incurred. So in accordance with the English language and the terms of construction, we can't treat heretofore incurred as like, you know, surplusage or something. It, it is, uh, it 
comports with the understanding of Section 3 that uh, the political disabilities were both retroactive and prospective. In 1872, the wording of that amendment, of that act, encompassed both. The 1898 wording only referred to retrospective. Now, you know, we, we heard some, you know, interesting things, you know, about uh, the history of uh, our country uh, uh, from uh, my fellow Hoosier <coughs> uh, law professor. He, uh, but he admitted that when Congress considered the uh, the 14th Amendment in Section 3. There was not a word about any other insurrection or rebellion other than the Civil War. And uh, that means that uh, history about Shays and about, about the Whiskey Rebellions, as interesting as they are, were to simply played no role. In other words, that that was a historical occurrence there is no evidence, even if we need to look at legislative history, no evidence that, that Congress considered that at all. So I, I will soon be talking to you about what we do know about what they thought in 1867. But uh, now, so let's get to uh, the meaning of, of the words in, in section uh, three. Engage in insurrection or rebellion is one, and uh, giving aid or comfort to the enemies thereof is number two. Well, that number two is about foreign wars, as I will soon explain. Number one is about domestic wars, as has been described, and was which were described at the time by authorities when they talked about those phrases. So, what is engagement? What is engage? It connotes conduct. And you will soon see hear the authority for the proposition that that is quote direct a a direct overt act such as voluntarily joining the armed forces of the Confederacy, uh, giving them food, giving the army food, you know, cash, whatever, uh, shelter. Uh, the people in the War Department prosecuting the war, etc. Now, there is not a single piece of evidence that any of those things occurred here with respect to Representative Green. There were certainly some 700 people involved, at least they have been charged to have been involved, in the attack on the Capitol. Green wasn't one of them. They agree with that. And there is no other act of direct, overt act of an insurrection nature that she is engaged in, not a single one. Now, of course, they're not satisfied with that. They want to use her political speech. And, and when they use their political speech, they want to use the nuances or the vagueness. Or wait a second, you didn't use the word peaceful in this one sentence, even though you said it over here. You didn't use it in this one sentence right here. And code words, for goodness sakes. Right there, this state is an insurrection, is uh, our insurrectionist. Right says it right there. 1876. Now, if you're going to use speech, which you can't use here because they didn't use the word incite violence, they said engage or incite an insurrection rebellion. They said engage in an insurrection rebellion. But it is instructive. 
Uh, and it's different because you can see, for instance, in the Act of 1862, uh, where there was a felony to, quote, incite, set on foot, whatever that means, assist or engage in any rebellion or insurrection, end of quote. That's codified at 18 U.S.C. section 2383. Those two, two words are used in the same list. Rules of construction tell you that they have to be different or they're surplusage and we never assume that Congress is, is just throwing words out there as surplus. So they, they necessarily mean a different thing. Brandenburg de, de, uh, uh, defined incitement as requiring speech that, quote, directed or inciting or producing imminent lawless action that is likely to incite or produce such, or that is likely to produce such action. Producing imminent lawless action. Now that's very restrictive. That's very limiting. And, and of course the reason is the protection of the First Amendment, with which we have now seen on full display here. Full display. The danger of construing words way beyond their meaning to allow political opponents to smear their, their opposition in a court of law. I know you're, you've got, you know, I, I understand the constraints your honor is under and, and the role that you play. And they have exploited that to the max. Well, uh, what are the words that do not amount to insurrection? Well, we, we know there are words like that or statements like that. Ku Klux Klan leader, quote, advocating the duty, necessity, or propriety of crime, sabotage, violence, or unlawful methods of terrorism as a means to accomplish industrial or political reform. And the court said, that's advocacy. That's not incitement of violence. The uh, a, a, a representative of the NAACP said, if we catch any of you going in any of them racist stores, we're going to break your damn neck, end of quote. That's a, in the NACP case. That is advocacy, not incitement for violence. And a Vietnam War, war protester. We're taking the effing street again, end of quote. Not incitement for violence, but advocacy protected by the First Amendment. So we know the kind of words that will be considered that. So what do we have from them? We have a rally. There is no evidence that there was anything but that that was anything but a peaceful rally. And and an uh, and, uh, 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 accusation that she organized it, which she didn't. And, uh, and while she, on a few occasions, urged people to go to it, she didn't even go to it herself and speak, and there was zero evidence that anything unlawful happened there. The, these kind of rallies happen in the capital of the United States numerous times every single year you know, on the ellipse. I attend one of them every every year, and uh, and you know, guess what was what one of the things they always say? And they, of course, these are left wing, right wing, Democrats, Republicans, whatever. What do they always say? Well, once we're done here, go to the Capitol, tell your representative, uh, you know, uh, to vote for our issue. Okay. That, in their world, is, vi is calling for violence. When it is absolutely appropriate for people to go to the capital of the United States to enter into it 
it's absolutely lawful to do that, to go talk to their congressman, watch the House and Senate, whatever, whatever they might do. Flood the Capitol. <coughs> it was a cold word, I guess. Flood the Capitol. Then, uh, uh, well, what about this, Representative Green? Did your staff take anyone on a tour of the Capitol between January 3rd and January 6th? Did any of you give any maps of the Capitol to anybody? What are they talking about? Congressmen do that every single day for their constituents. Is giving a tour or giving out a map some sort of code word or to be viewed as what? Participating in a lawless riot? Oh, but 1776. Or what about Independence Day? Or how about talking about the Declaration of Independence? Or what about uh, talking about the uh, Revolutionary War for our independence? These are now code words for advocating a violent overthrow of the government of the United States. What an outrage. They want to hijack and cancel words like 1776, the Declaration of Independence, Independence Day, and the American Revolution. What about, oh no, defense of the Second Amendment? If you advocate for defense of the Second Amendment, you're in favor and in fact are engaging in the uh, the violent overthrow of the government of the United States. Well, that, 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 that's the implication, isn't it? Right? And of course the Second Amendment says that the very the first part of it, you know, a well-regulated militia, you know, necessary for, you know, a free republic or whatever, I don't remember exactly, then the citizens have the right to keep and bear arms. So yes, there, there's a military application, if you will, the, mil the militia. I mean, the militia won this, you know, uh, was a major factor in winning our Revolutionary War. Many people who were in the Indiana militia fought in the Civil War. And so, and they were able to do that because of the, first, the Second Amendment in, in many cases. So, Advocating for the Second Amendment is now a code word for engaging in insurrection and rebellion against the United States. How about uh, get our freedoms back? Giving our freedoms back. She said those words. Oh, my word. I mean, uh, yes, people on the conservative side are concerned that the Biden administration is eroding our freedoms. I mean, we just got one back as a result of a federal judge just like, what, two or three days ago. And uh, so, yes, uh, that is a concern about what will happen with the election of Biden, and it's proven to be the case. We have lost our freedoms, some of them. And to be concerned about that is qu quintessential political speech. Well, what about, uh, they keep saying this, events of January 6th. So, what we're going to do is just mush them all together, right? They're all one thing, just mush them all together. Well, the First Amendment doesn't per, per, per allow you to do that. The, what the First Amendment provides with respect to freedom of association, which is what a rally is, or under the First Amendment as an assembly, protected by the First Amendment is, is that if you have a peaceful rally, which they had, there's no evidence uh, uh, otherwise, some people leave, as some people did, and went to the Capitol, and some of them committed an illegal act. This rally does not lose its per First Amendment protection. Because the actions of a few that show up in that situation 
are not, uh, cannot be attributed to the organization itself or who would ever have, who could ever have a rally? I mean, nobody can guarantee that somebody might show up, uh, whether they be supporters of what they're, what the rally's about or agent provocateurs or whatever, and cause illegal acts to occur or violence. You, you, you can't, I mean, I've been to a rally with 500,000 people on the ellipse of the Capitol. And uh, how, how do you guarantee that? And, the, and, and so what, what, there's a two-step analysis. First, was the rally peaceful and nonviolent? Unquestionably so, under, under uh, 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 what we know and what the evidence is. Well, can the rally be held into account for what the few did that left the rally, went to the Capitol, and the few there, some 700, who attacked the Capitol. And this is what the Supreme Court said in the NAACP case. The right to association does not lose all constitutional protect protection merely because some members of the group may have participated in conduct or advocated doctrines that itself is not protected. The NAACP is particularly instructive here in that, and that was end quote, the NAACP is particularly instructive here as there were constitutionally protected speech, association, and petition designed to influence government action, i.e. support the constitutional right of, of members of Congress to object in the uh, two votes on the uh, regarding the Electoral College. Along with the illegal actions by a few, but the acts of the latter don't strip the others of their First Amendment rights where the government failed to prove that, quote, the NAACP authorized either actually or apparently the unlawful con conduct, either authorized it or ratified it, actually or apparently. There's no evidence of that. There's not a single word about that. So we have different events, some that are subject to First Amendment protection, others the attack on the Capitol that are not. And to drag her into, well, did you promote the rally? Did you, you know, did you put it on your calendar? Did you, were you invited to speak? Joe Blow said you were invited to speak. It's to strip her of her First Amendment right. All of these are First Amendment protected activities, every single one of them. And none of them constitute even uh, incitement, much less uh, constitute uh, engaging uh, in unlawful conduct. Now, of course, the uh, question of the of the of the quote insurrection. Uh, the insurrection is narrowly defined. Uh, I quoted cases, some from 1898-4, some from 1842, some from uh, uh, a, a, the uh, 1795 Militia Act, that all said basically the same thing which is it has to be a armed uprising that is so formidable as to defy the authority of the United States in order to suppress it. And, uh, and of course, we have a case, uh, uh, CJS says about riot, is that you can have mob violence and it's not an insurrection uh, unless it is so serious that a uh, actually military force is required to suppress it. Now, uh, I mean, how, how do we know all this? Okay. Well, uh, in 1867, and it came up, went up on the uh, screen, P48 that has been admitted, uh, was put up on the screen for a moment. And I have that, and I'd like to give you a copy.
Now, I don't know who can read the exhibit and present it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I confess I cannot. Okay. However, therefore, what I have done is at 3 o'clock in the morning, Thursday morning, uh, I figured out how to not only, you know, zoom it, okay, to make it larger, the applicable sections, but copy them. So I did that. And those are the attachments, all right? Now, because it was two, you know, three o'clock in the morning, I kind of screwed up on my numbering, so it's 1A and 1B, and then I go 2 through 14 or so. And this takes you step by step through the analysis of the Attorney General of the United States in 1867. That was mentioned on, on the stand, okay? Uh, and, and shown to you. Uh, what the words engage in insurrection or rebellion and get, giving aid or comfort to the enemies there mean and meant in 1867 because those words were not just used in 1868 in the 14th Amendment but they were used and this is what the, the Attorney General was addressing uh, it was used in uh, Reconstruction Act uh, because they were going to open up voting to the uh, people who lived in the Confederacy, old Confederacy, and they were required to take an oath. And that oath, in order to register to vote, one of its sections was that they have to swear that they did not, quote, engage in insurrection or rebellion or uh, give, gave aid and comfort to the enemies of the United States. It's the exact words, okay? So it, the first A, A, 1A starts about in the, the, I, I, in the middle column. We're going to go down the middle column for a while. All right? And uh, uh, it, it starts with uh, considering. I now come to consider the meaning of the disqualification arising from the, this point of the oath that requires a person to state that he is, quote, not engaged in an insurrect or rebellion against the United States or given aid and comfort. Uh, each of these are separately considered according to the, the uh, Attorney General. On the next page, now it's on the left a little bit. Uh, my duty here is one of simple construction. And, and I thought this was important. He, he was not applying constitutional concepts to his construction, which of course under modern First Amendment jurisprudence, I mean, you absolutely have to do that. And as you know, uh, uh, has happened in the NACP case, etc., as we have discussed. Uh, and uh, even at that, he viewed the oath because you couldn't vote as depriving you of a right, and uh, and that was uh, that was important to his analysis. On page two. He goes to uh, uh, that the uh, requirement of the oath and the disqualification must be viewed as a punishment for that conduct. And as a result, it made the oath uh, even more objectionable than, than the fact that it was also a violation of a right and a right to vote. Now, uh, then on page three, uh, he said, any doubts must be resolved in the you know, favor of the voter. Right? And, uh, and then said, what acts then are within the meaning of this provision? Well, at the bottom he says, well, the first sentence, engage in insurrection or rebellion, covers the case of domestic war. And the second phrase, uh, aid or comfort to the enemy, uh, applies to foreign war. So in this context, we need to be looking at engaging in insurrection or rebellion. Uh, he continues on on page four on that analysis. Page five is not, I'm sure, interesting, but not relevant. 
Uh, and then we go to page six. We are now to inquire what is meant by engaging in insurrection or rebellion against the United States. He said first, the force of the term to engage carries the idea of active rather than passive and voluntary rather than uh, compulsory. And uh, he then uh, analyzes the voluntary part, all right, that uh, conscripts cannot be charged with engaging because it's involuntary. Uh, but somebody who voluntarily joined can be. On page seven, he takes, uh, he uh, begins to consider, uh, you know, uh, the, the question of uh, whether persons may have engaged in rebellion with actual, without having actually levied war or taking up arms, and he finds in that regard that, for instance, people in the War Department of the Confederacy uh, did engage, even though they didn't literally take up arms. We then go to uh, uh, why uh, civil officers are not covered, you know, people that uh, just run the government, uh, you know, maintain the peace, you know, uh, do perform civil functions, they're simply not covered. Uh, uh, so, uh, and he continues that discussion on page uh, nine, that it, that I now concur in what amounts to individual participation in the rebellion. And of course, he, he agrees that that it isn't only the Civil War that is to be considered, but that the Civil War provides much instruction on what uh, is meant by rebellion uh, or insurrection. Uh, again, page 11 is continuing the discussion of voluntary participation. And then on page 12, uh, at the top, he says, well, what is, is engaged? It says, quote, I am of the opinion that, that some direct co uh, overt act done with the intent to further the rebellion is necessary to bring a party within the pur purview of engaged. A direct over act done with the intent to further the rebellion. That is where I get the phrase direct over act. And, and then he says, mere disloyal sentiments, think of their evidence, mere disloyal sem sem sentiments or expressions are not sufficient because they're not acts. Their talk. And so that is where we find out, surely, I mean, by one of the most authoritative, authoritative uh, sources, the Attorney General of the United States, at the very time this, these phrases are used in several Constitutional provisions, one, and statutes, several, about what it means. It does not mean nuance. It does not mean in innuendo. It does not mean code words. It does not mean First Amendment protected speech. A direct overt act is conduct, and it has to be with the intent to, to, intent to further not some political agenda or whatever, but the actual uh, insurrection that is occurring, the domestic war, as they described it, he described it, that was occurring. Anything short of that, and every political disagreement is gonna be characterized by bold, well-funded lawyers 
and interest groups into you're going to have to fight for your life. You're going to be disqualified from Congress. You're going to be whatever they can do to you. Maybe in the worst possible situation, charged with a federal offense. Those are the same words are used in a federal crime of a felony. I mean, and that's why I said at the beginning two things. This is not about uh, hyperbole, political smears, at least in my opinion. It has never been about that. It has to be about the law and what the law provides. Understanding that if this line is breached so that the political hyperbole of calling people insurrectionists turns into lawsuits brought by interest groups in order to abort our democracy, destroy the rights of voters to vote for the candidacy of their choice, and preclude individual members from running for re-election. Our, our, our democracy, Your Honor, cannot survive that. We, we cannot survive these trials right here. This was never designed to do what, what they have employed it to do. Uh, we are stripped of our rights. Okay, we can't do discovery. We can't dis move to dismiss their complaint before a trial. Or, and certainly there's no time, I mean we could try, but no time to, to do it, right? Uh, and, and we come into a hearing, all these cameras and all these live streaming and all this, why are they interested in this? Because Representative Green's on the ballot? Oh, please. No, this is a political agenda. And this has been a political show trial, not because of your fault, but because of their exploitation of what we have done here, what has been done here. I mean, this, this procedure is for, you're not 25, Representative Green, and she comes in with a birth certificate. This is not for a major trial that of intense, factual, and legal consequences and elements part of which, constitutional claims, federal claims, cannot even be, be heard by you in terms of decision. We have got to put a stop to this, and this is where it should happen, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Your Honor, Mr. Bopp talked a lot about the law, a little bit about the history, not much about the facts. I'm going to try to confine my remarks to the facts, and we're going to submit a brief, as Your Honor knows, next week with responses to all the interesting legal issues that Mr. Bopp has raised. But it's been a long day, and it's been a difficult day, and it's been a solemn day. And we find ourselves back where we started, with the disqualification clause of the 14th Amendment and its three very simple requirements. That the candidate for federal office had taken the oath to the Constitution, that an insurrection occurred, and that the candidate, having taken that oath, engaged in insurrection, promoted it, supported it, assisted it, helped bring it into fruition. Those are the three elements we were, came here today prepared to prove, and those are the three elements that we have proved. Let's talk about each of the three. Marjorie Taylor Greene took the oath of office on January 3rd, 2021. She became a member of the United States House of Representatives, the body that represents not the states, but the people of the country in general. We the people. Now, Mr. Bob said this morning, words matter, and we agree with that. Our proof today started with the oath. 
because in taking the oath, Miss Green understood a very undertook a very solemn and very specific obligation to uphold the Constitution, to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, taking that oath was an honor, but it was also an obligation. Ms. Green was no longer a simple citizen of the great state of Georgia. She wasn't just another person with opinions and a Twitter account. She became part of our government. And she took on an affirmative obligation as part of our government to protect the Constitution, to protect its processes from anyone who would seek to block or impede them. That is what the Disqualification Clause is all about. That special status that is conferred upon a person when she takes the oath of office. Now we'll argue in our brief to this court that that status means that Ms. Green can't just say anything she wants that she could have said as a private citizen. And our brief will also point out that there are lots of things that people say that are words that matter and that also have con legal consequences. But for that, all of that is for another day. Today, the evidence has proven factually that not only did Marjorie Greene um, engage in the ceremony of taking the oath to the Constitution, we've proven that the oath has meaning, that it has teeth, that it has consequences. Insurrection. What happened at the U.S. Capitol building on January 6, 2021 was an insurrection. It's as clear as day. And even Mr. Bopp doesn't really deny it. And how do we know that? Because he keeps talking about the rally. It's the rally. It's the ellipse. It's the rally. We're not talking about the rally. We're talking about what happened at the Capitol. Now, there are lots of words and phrases that can be used to describe what's on that Washington Post video that Your Honor has viewed a couple of times. Lawlessness, disturbance, a riot. And Ms. Green and her counsel have used some of those words today and in their briefs. But the word they really avoid using is insurrection. A riot can be an insurrection. We learned that today from Professor Magliaca. Insurrections can be disturbances. They are lawless. They are unrest. But when it's used in the disqualification clause, an insurrection is more than these things. It is something where the purpose of it is to block, impede, disrupt a constitutional process, or to overthrow the very existence of the government itself. Professor Magliocca explained all of this and how American history has faced many insurrections in the past and how all of them share the same features. Violence, aimed at the processes or the legitimacy of government. Sometimes they're aimed at courts. In this case, they were aimed at the legislature. And, and the violence that cannot be quelled by ordinary law enforcement means. Judge Boudreau, you saw and heard with your own eyes not just the violence, horrific and sickening as it is, but its goal, which was to stop the certification of the Electoral College vote in favor of Joe Biden. Its goal was to stop the constitutional process of the 12th Amendment, the peaceful process of transferring power between presidents. Its goal was to physically prevent Congress from meeting to do the essential work of our democracy. And here's the worst of it. It worked. For a time, the insurrection worked. It succeeded only briefly, but it worked. The joint session of Congress adjourned for several hours into the next morning and ceased carrying out its 12th Amendment function, all because of the insurrection. 
because people violently flooded the capital with the goal of striking fear in the hearts of the people who work there and to use violence. Fear, violence, flooding the capital. These are words that came out of Marjorie Taylor Greene's mouth. Now, many people were responsible for this attack on our democracy. Most of, most of all, of course, the individuals that you saw on the Washington Post video and many other places. They defiled the people's house. But they're not the only ones. There were others as well, the leaders, the people who justified, who promoted, who supported, who assisted, who encouraged this in the days and weeks leading up to January 6th. Marjorie Taylor Greene is one of those people. And how do we know this? We know this from the evidence. Let's start by talking about what we're talking about. As a legal matter, in, in order to be disqualified from federal office, Ms. Green had to have engaged in insurrection sometime after January 3rd, 2021, when she took the oath. Your Honor, you've said it yourself. It's a narrow window, January 3rd to January 6th, 2001. And the evidence is, is very clear that, in fact, Marjorie Taylor Greene justified, assisted, supported, and promoted the insurrection in that window. That's what the term engaging in insurrection means under the law, and we will lay that out in great detail in our brief next week. It's a legal point, but it's a common sense point as well. Jefferson Davis didn't take up the musket and fire on Union troops, at least as far as I remember my history. But he was just as much an insurrectionist as the tens of thousands of soldiers for the Confederacy who did. Now, the January 3 to January 6 window can really only be understood by looking at the facts of what happened before that window and before the oath. There's really no dispute about this either. We have proven that Marjorie Taylor Greene was an advocate for violence against government officials. In fact, she advocated violence against the Speaker of the House, the highest ranking member of the House, Mrs. Pelosi, the very House that was attacked on January 6, 2021. She admitted it. She kind of wiggled there for a second, and then she admitted it, and you saw that with your eyes. Treason, the death penalty, a bullet in the head. That's what she said about Nancy Pelosi. And we have proven that she saw the invasion of the Capitol building and creating fear, fear is the word that she used, in the hearts of public officials, that she saw that as, as a legitimate political tactic. And when she told people, when she was discussing this tactic, that she told them they should feel like they can act in a violent way. She denied it, not really. She said, I don't remember. That's not, that's CNN, that's fake news. Don't buy that. You don't have to accept that. You saw the videos and you saw the testimony. We have proven that Marjorie Taylor Greene was very clear on certain occasions with her supporters about her support for political violence. She said it on tape. The price of blood would need to be paid if the government took away her freedoms. She wouldn't even admit that that was a call for violence. She said something about the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, a bunch of other amendments. The price of blood could not be more clear. Now, this didn't happen in high school, as Mr. Bob suggested in one of his objections. This happened in late October of 2020, when she was interviewed by Mr. Doerr, and she was talking about 
how her freedoms and the freedoms of Americans could be taken away by a tyrannical government. It doesn't just come back on its own, these freedoms, she said. It has to be taken back with the price of blood. These are things that Marjorie Taylor Greene said as a private citizen, candidate for federal office, but a private citizen nonetheless, before the 2020 election. And maybe she has the right to say those things, or had the right, before she took the oath. But let's keep going. Let's keep moving down the timeline to the period after the election. And in that period, you saw and heard Ms. Taylor Greene speaking out consistently in claiming that the 2020 election was stolen by the Democrats. I disagree with that point of view, but I respect that people can have that point of view, and it's a perfectly, um, it's an acceptable part of our political discourse, for better or for worse. But then she said this, not just that the election was stolen, not just that there were ballots that were fraudulent, not just that it's time to make objections, perfectly legitimate thing to do. We have no problem with her objections on the floor of the House. But then she said something else. That mask that Mr. Fine spoke about this morning, it came down for just a minute. We can't allow power to transfer peacefully like Joe Biden wants because he didn't win the election. We can't allow power to transfer peacefully. You saw and heard it with your own eyes, Judge. She said the quiet part out loud. She spoke her truth in a video that she made, that she posted on her own Facebook page, and that she wanted her hundreds of thousands of Facebook followers and the untold millions of other people to whom it would be available to know that her point of view was that you can't allow we can't allow poverty and the power to transfer peacefully. Marjorie Taylor Greene said this when she was a federal official or right about to be. It's not clear. But what we can tell from the context of that tape is that she stated her opposition to the peaceful transfer of power. And it was a stunning statement. This is not internet drivel. This is not the dark corners of parlor. This is a person who's a federal official, a member of government. And this wasn't even a rhetorical flourish on the back of a campaign truck after a long day. This is somebody who sat down in front of a camera and calmly and carefully told her viewers we will not accept a peaceful transfer of power. We can't allow it. And then she said, we will not go quietly into the night. She framed this as an existential battle, a new 4th of July, a new 4th of July, 1776. This brings us right up to and into that critical window that critical phase of time, January 3rd to January 6th, Marjorie Taylor Greene's rallying cry for violence at the Capitol on January 6th were the words 1776. Now I think we all know that those words have a lot of meanings. They mean a lot to me. They are on the, on the seal of the great state of Georgia and I, and I venerate that. But that's not what Marjorie Taylor Greene was talking about. And here's how we know this, because here's what we've proved. Marjorie Taylor Greene organized objections on the floor of the House, and this was not an insurrection. This actually was part of the constitutional process, and we have no, pro no issue with it. But then, Marjorie Taylor Greene promoted, encouraged, and supported the idea of large demonstrations in Washington on January 6th. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with large demonstrations either. And this is Mr. Bopp's point about the rally on the ellipse, not the insurrection at the Capitol. He says, well, you know, who cares? It's a good thing. I agree. People do these things all the time. I've done them as well. And demonstrations are an important and venerated part of our democratic tradition. She worked with organizers and made calls for people to come, and that's not a problem. Out of context. Out of context, it's not a problem. In context, this support was part of a scheme, a scheme where lawful demonstrations were Plan A, the first step, and there was also Plan B. What was going to happen when all the lawful demonstrations happened and all the objections on the floor of the House were heard, and as everyone knew, they were futile. The votes were there to certify the election of Joe Biden. There was a Plan B, and Plan B was violence at the Capitol. Plan B was to physically enter the Capitol illegally, not on a tour, a tourist tour, busting in the windows and doors, as you saw on that video, injuring and ultimately causing the deaths of law enforcement to block the certification of Joe Biden as the winner of the 2020 election. That's what Plan B was. And Plan B had a name. It had a code name. 1776. Now, how do we know that? Well, the clues are everywhere. On December 30th, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweets out a rumor that their lawful objections on the floor of the House may be blocked by a rule change. And Ali Alexander, who she acknowledges knowing, who says she's a friend, he's the organizer of a major demonstration, he tweets in response to that, 1776 is always an option. And he refers to what 500,000 people will do to that building if the objections are suppressed by a rule change. That's what that tweet exchange is about. I don't believe that Marjorie Taylor Greene doesn't read every response to her tweets and care about them. I think she acknowledged it in, in truth. And she knew exactly what 1776 meant in that context. She denied it, sort of, not really, I can't remember, don't buy it. She knows exactly what Mr. Alexander was referring to. And by the way, when, when that tweet came out and that reference came out to 1776, we don't see a response that says, what, what, what is this? I don't, I don't know what this is about, uh, or, Gee, if you're talking about doing violence in the Capitol, 500,000 people doing something to that building, I want no part of that. And we heard a lot about Ms. Green's saying that she's always peaceful, and she put out comments about peacefulness never won before January 6th, only after. That video, after. Those press releases, after. You gotta ask yourself, why is that? Well, obviously the insurrection succeeded for only a few hours, and then the tide turned, and people saw it for what it was, and she needed a cover story. Marjorie Taylor Greene knew perfectly well what 1776 meant, that it meant violence against the government, overthrowing a tyrannical government, and that that was the plan B of January 6, 2021. She embraced it and she promoted it. And probably the most important piece of evidence from our point of view in this case is plaintiff's exhibit or petitioner's exhibit 27. This is the short clip of Marjorie Taylor Greene on Newsmax. It's the night before January 6th. She's asked a number of questions about the objections that she and others are gonna lawfully file on the floor. And 
Then the broadcaster asks her, so what's your plan? How do you think this is gonna play out and roll out tomorrow? And her answer is one sentence. This is our 1776 moment. It's a stunning statement. It has no meaning unless you know the code. It has no meaning unless you're in the club. It's 1776. It's plan B. It's block the certification. It's flood the capital. It's use violence if you have to. This is a message posted, stated on January 5th, in the middle of that window, posted on Facebook to her hundreds of thousands of followers and anybody else who wanted to see it on January 5th from a sitting member of the United States Congress. It was her clarion call. People knew what she meant. They knew exactly what she meant. Tomorrow is our 1776 moment. Now it's interesting that the examination that Mr. Bopp did of his client never asked her about that. Never asked her about providing support to people who were planning the demonstrations or providing support for people who ultimately broke into and trashed the People's Temple. Never asked her any of those questions. She never addressed it. When I asked her, she said, I don't remember, I'm not sure, I don't think so. So what do you have before you, Your Honor, at this point? You have her own words in context against nothing, not even a real denial. Judge Boudreau, Marjorie Taylor Greene comes to this court and this nation and she asks to be a candidate for federal office. She comes with unclean <coughs> hands. With her hands, her words, her actions, she was one of several leaders who gathered the kindling, who created the conditions, who made it possible for there to be an explosion of violence at the Capitol on January 6th. And then she dropped the match. Now she comes into this courtroom and she says she's surprised and appalled that a fire occurred. Sticks of wood and dry leaves are harmless in and of themselves. In fact, they're natural, they're healthy for the environment. Rallies, protestations, objections on the floor. These are all things that are good for the Republic. They're part of our tradition. But when the conditions are dangerous, some people capitalize in, on those conditions and they add a spark, a flame, that causes all of those things to, to explode into a fire, violence, and death. That flame can be in the form of actual assistance given to people who perform the acts of violence, like the quartermaster in the Confederate Army who passes out the muskets and the balls and the rations. But that flame can also be a spark by words, by signals, by signs, by code, by promotion, by justification, by support, by assistance. And that is what Marjorie Taylor Greene did. That's why we're here. Your Honor, we urge you to find that Marjorie Taylor Greene is disqualified from the ballot under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of one of the greatest political documents in the history of the world, the United States Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. Um, I, it's, it's quite late, but I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to talk about the uh, briefing uh, and a couple of things. First of all, I would greatly appreciate it if someone would get us a copy of this. It's, you know, a blown up version or something that's easier to read. I mean, I appreciate what you did, Mr. Bach, but I, somebody could do a better job of it. That'd be great. No offense. It's beyond my capacity. That, but I'm sure you have folks that could do that. that and, that, and that gets into a couple of things about the briefing. Um, again, briefing's due about you know, midnight on Thursday. Um, a couple of things. I want to be sure that, Mr. Bob, one of your objections, the first one I think in the motion to dismiss,
Smith's was about the the fact that this procedure, and I know I can't determine it's unconstitutional, but I'm talking about findings, um, about related to the belief and, and the, the concern, some of which you voiced in your closing argument. If I would like to hear what you would like for me to think about finding. I mean, I, I, I mean I, we haven't really talked about that very much because it's not, a it's not something I can decide, but it's something I need to consider. In particular, uh, I think the question of the word believe, and I think I mentioned the footnote reasonable. I mean, there's there's issues there. I would appreciate both sides to comment on that. You don't need to write 40 pages, but I'd like to understand your views on that, and I'm sure you and Court will. Um, we mentioned this. Uh, is some, we, we're dealing with some very ancient, historical, ancient, you know, ancient, I mean, you know, 200 years old. You know, what is it? Europeans laugh at us. They live in houses. Uh, but in all seriousness, some of these some of these authorities are pretty obscure. As long as we can find them and pull them up, that's great. Uh, particularly like if there's a link and it's public, you know, somewhere that's great. If it's something that's really obscure that's not readily available on the internet, you can't point us to. First of all, our first preference is just show it, you know, tell us where it is on the internet where we can find it, or you know, if it's readily available, that's not a problem. Uh, if that's not available, please uh, supplement your briefs with copies of anything arcana like that, so that we don't have to spend time chasing stuff down, because we don't have time, a lot of time either. Um, I, I, obviously, I kind of leave it to y'all how you want to organize your respective briefs. Uh, we, at this point, the record has gotten a little bit chaotic, because we've had so much back and forth, and we've had a number of quarters, and so And I know, Mr. Bob, that in your, you've got your original motion to dismiss a lot of those arguments, which you made in your closing. It might help, if you don't mind doing it, to maybe put them together again in light of this hearing and maybe focus on the streamline so I just don't have to wallow around trying to look at multiple documents. I'm sure Mr. Shelley would do the same thing. Um, brevity is always better. You know, what is it, write it like you think I'm going to sign it. Um, because it, we, we do need to get this done. I mean, the Georgia courts move very fast. I, we move very fast. I, I hope to have it out within a week of you're all getting it to us, you know. So uh, it, this is this is it, 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 it is this extraordinary important stuff. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, and thank you for the direction uh, yeah. on the it, briefing. It, yeah. And uh, fortunately, my associate Melina Siebert, who's done a really fine job, uh, is listening. Yeah. And I'm sure taking notes. <laughs> so we'll do the best we can. Right. And again, I know. Again, I know. I know everybody's running and gunning, and I know you. I gather there's been an appeal filed. To the Eleventh Circuit, so I'm, I don't know what your briefing schedule is on that. I know there's the, there's a briefing schedule in the in the Fourth Circuit case. I, I'm sure you have a lot of fires to put out, and I'm fully cognizant of that. But, but so just uh, do do the, I'm sure you do the work. By the way, y'all have done great work. I mean, everything everybody's working under exigent circumstances very quickly, and uh, and everybody's taking it seriously what needs to be taken. So I'm sure it will be very helpful, and we look forward to uh, getting it and. and Finishing this stage of the uh, the matter, is there before we close? Is there anything else? Nothing from Petitioner. Thank you. No, other than Your Honor, you, you've really done a fine job in a very extraordinary way. Thank, thank you, thank time. you. Flattery yeah. is always appreciated. <laughs> Put us down for flattery too, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's it. I think when uh, when it's merited, it ought to be provided. Well, you're very uh, thank you. And, and I appreciate it. everybody's conduct and discipline, and so I appreciate everybody who's scrambling to be here. So. With that, I think that can